Hello everyone. Today I'm going to go over a recent blog post I made about whether or not Babylon the Great could be the United States and if it will be made uninhabitable by nukes in 2024. This blog post is available on Medium and I'm going over it here because there are a lot of connections that are difficult to pull out just by reading it. Um, so I'm going to read through it and comment on it as I go along. So the, the Bible describes the fall of Babylon the Great in detail and provides ample descriptions that link Babylon the Great to the USA or NATO. Furthermore, contrary to com common belief, the Bible provides the exact year counts for when everything will occur. There is no need to interpret vague warnings like eclipses and earthquakes, wars and rumors of wars, etc. Furthermore, the Bible provides detailed description, including measurements and contents of intercontinental ballistic missiles or nuclear missiles. Babylon or NATO will be destroyed suddenly in a surprise attack and quickly in just one hour by an alliance of nations that are named coming from the north, which I believe are uh, Russia, Iran, Syria, and or the BRICS nations, and, and that they will not spare any nukes and none will miss. Now, according to the book of Daniel, all of this death and destruction will occur on the 70th Jubilee from when Israel became a nation, or when they crossed the Jordan and received their land. This 70th Jubilee starts in 2024. Thankfully, the prophet Jeremiah describes the rapture occurring in the midst of the fall of Babylon, also known as the USA. And all of those who keep the commandments of Jehovah and who have the testimony of Yeshua will escape to Zion. So it looks like we have a rapture, nuclear war combination. This uh, post, or this video, is going to provide the uh, scriptural evidence to support the claims above. Uh, the time is short, so it's it's uh, urgent to get this message out there and to repent, fast, mourn, pray, and wake up everyone around. All right, <clears throat> so if I'm right, the first thing we have to establish is that the United States or its allies is Babylon the Great. Now, there are many names that Babylon goes by in the Bible. Uh, these include the land of the Chaldeans or Shinar. Uh, Shinar means the land of two rivers, traditionally uh, in the Middle East, you refer to these river and uh, I forget the other one. Uh, but it could also be referred to the Mississippi and Missouri River, which are the only two large rivers that are entirely within the United States. Uh, it is also called the Great City. So Babylon the Great, hereafter called Babylon, in which is all the kings and all the merchants of the earth. So let's, let's start with the verses that people are probably most familiar with. And then I'll uh, talk about some of the other verses from the Old Testament to give support. The kings of the earth who committed fornication, which means they worshipped her and lived luxuriously with her, will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. That's from Revelation 18.9. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as traded on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, Who is like this great city? Revelation 18.17. So this verse indicates to me that the majority of the world accesses Babylon by sea. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think the United States is a good fit. But... Uh, we'll see later that it, there's a lot better evidence than that. So, they threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. Which means there's nothing left of her. One hour. Uh, so the only thing I can think of that can make any country or any place desolate in a single hour would be uh, nuclear. Um, so, not only was she made desolate in a mere hour, it will be uninhabitable forevermore. 
The following verse mentions the Great Millstone, which is a reference to Old Testament prophecies about the fall of Babylon, which I will link to. So Then a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus, with violence, the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. For your merchants, the corporate giants, were the great men, the billionaires, of the earth. And for your, by your sorcery, which the Greek word there is pharmakia, uh, which could imply drugs, the jab, or propaganda. So by that sorcery, all the nations were deceived. So Babylon was... Uh, a great liar, deception, uh, lots of deception coming from Babylon. Then he said to me, <clears throat> this is from Revelation 17, the waters which you saw where the harlot, or Babylon, where it sits, so the waters are the people. So the people where Babylon sits are the peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns, which I think is bricks, bricks now has ten members, uh, which is uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and um, uh, I forget the S uh, at the moment, Syria maybe, um, which you saw on the beast. These will hate the harlot. Those countries don't really like the United States right now. They will make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So fire is a, a key theme of uh how Babylon's going to fall. For Elohim has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, to give the kingdom to the beast. Uh, if my theory is correct, that could be Putin or what's left of Russia. Um, so, you know, the, the key thing here is to recognize is that it's to fulfill his purpose and that... Um, so and the, the, he put it into their hearts. So this is not just something that men are coming up with on their own, but it's, uh, he's claiming responsibility. Uh, uh, Jehovah is. Uh, so, until the words of Elohim are fulfilled, and the woman you saw, who, the woman whom you saw, that is the great city Babylon, which reigns over the kings of the earth. Uh, so... That gives us a pretty good idea uh, that the ten horns or the ten kings are going to be the ones that do it and are responsible, and that they're going to be the agent by which his judgment will come. So with the world reserve currency, all the nations of the earth are subject by, and taxed with inflation by the United States. Even China and Russia are built up by their trade with us. Uh, the power of the world reserve, reserve currency has made the USA the most powerful and wealthiest nation on the earth. And all countries bow before her economic or military might. Uh, until recently, there's been increasing uh, resistance to the United States. But you know, the, the power of sanctions and the power of our currency, uh, all trade for oil is done in the dollar. Um, so everyone is uh, doing business with us through our currency. So, given the limits on the prophetic timeline, the 7,000-year history, the timeline of, um, of Daniel's uh, 70 jubilees and other things that I'll get to, uh, there's no other nation on earth can come close to meeting the description of Babylon uh, if the United States were to fall and something else were to rise up. So, I, I think given the, the restrictions there, it narrows it down pretty closely. Then we have Revelation 18.16. That great city was clothed in fine linen, purple, and scarlet. Which, uh, <clears throat> the colors here could be interpreted as white, navy, blue, and red. Now the linen, the purple, and the scarlet. The uh, color navy blue wasn't really a color, but it's a mixture of purple, blue, and indigo. And it didn't really become a named color until about the 1700s. So given the context of when this was written, uh, that's a pretty good description. That alone doesn't narrow it down, but it is a, a confirming uh, characteristic. Uh, so there are some other verses which people have pro proposed which suggest that Jerusalem is the mystery Babylon. 
However, uh, without the support of the United States, Israel, the state or the country, not the people, would not likely exist today. Uh, but they had, there's this verse from Revelation, And their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city Babylon, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord Yeshua was crucified. Well, well there's only one uh, city, that Jerusalem, that meets that. And the word the great city implies Babylon, uh, <clears throat> but um, there's some problems I have with with that. Uh, one, Babylon is uh, more than one one city. Uh, second, all the nations of the earth don't trade or get rich off of Jerusalem as a city or a particular location. Uh, and uh, I, I believe a lot of the earth would. Uh, Rejoice if something were to happen to Jerusalem, because um, it's just a, a point of conflict. So um, they, they don't have the world reserve currency. You can't access Jerusalem by the sea. Uh, there's there's a whole bunch of problems with with Jerusalem being um, Babylon. Uh, they might be viewed as part of Babylon in the sense that uh, Israel, the state, is um, largely. Uh, part of the United States by extension because they were so closely connected. All right. Um, so Jerusalem is going to be restored and rebuilt, whereas Babylon the Great is going to be tied to a stone and thrown into the sea, never to be seen again. So likewise, no one will use stones from Babylon to lay a foundation ever again. So these statements do not apply to Jerusalem. This is especially true because uh, Revelation eleven eighteen is three and a half years later uh, after the destruction of Babylon, uh, at least by my, because this is after the two witnesses um, uh, witnessed for three and a half years. So given that I believe the fall of Babylon is at the beginning of the tribulation, which we'll establish later, um, it really rules out the possibility that Jerusalem alone is is Babylon the Great. All right, so we can get some more description uh, of what Babylon is like uh, from the prophet Habakkuk. Uh, and it describes how the USA has plundered the world with its debt-based money. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law unto themselves. We make laws in the United States that uh, apply worldwide. Right, we put our securities laws, sanctions, you name it. Uh, we are a law unto ourselves and we promote our own honor. Uh, well, whatever honor there is in the United States. They fly like an eagle. How appropriate, given our, our country's bird. Swooping to devour, they shall come intent on violence. They mock kings. They scoff at rulers. We really don't respect the rule of any other country. They either do what we say, or we sanction them, or we uh, you know, use economic warfare against them. They laugh at all fortified cities. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. So, yeah, I think our country, you know, we just worship power. And, uh, and so that's a uh, pretty apt description. So, and they go on mercilessly to destroying nations without sparing Think about all the countries that we've invaded or um, extorted or had coups to install puppets. You know, you got Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Ukraine. We're messing with Russia. Uh, you know, that, and it's many, many more than that. So we have destroyed a lot of nations. And then in Habakkuk 2, we go on to see, will not uh, your creditors... Uh, suddenly arise. Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey. So who are the creditors of the United States, if not China, part of BRICS? Um, 
And, you know, clearly Babylon has a lot of debt. Uh, so that rules out any other options for Babylon that aren't heavily laden in debt. Because of you, uh, because you, Babylon, have plundered many nations, that uh, we plunder them with our inflation and our, our currency. Um, the peoples who are left, uh, the bricks, will plunder you. For you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. All right. So with that, I think that we've got a pretty good description of the United States uh, compared to any other nation on earth. Uh, that's uh, pretty, and pretty much settles it as far as I'm concerned. All right. So now we're going to talk about nuclear annihilation and the thief in the night. All right. So there's only one thing that I think could destroy any country in a single hour and leave it desolate, and that would be a nuke. So an all-out surprise nuclear attack, not like a one nuke or two, but like a complete wiping of the of the country. Um, so with that context, are there any scriptures that we can uh, study that would lend support to that theory? And believe it or not, uh, there's a, a great scripture, Zechariah 5. Uh, and I'm going to translate it with uh, the modern context. Right? I don't think this verse could be understood until the past uh, 80 years or so. Um, and the reason for that is because in Hebrew, the uh, word for woman and the word for sacrifice burnt in its entirety or of fire are the same three letters. These vowel points uh, here and here, um, those are not in the original text. They were added later. So the scribes that were responsible for adding these without context um, don't necessarily know which one. And you know, there's oral tradition and other things, but you can see how it'd be really easy to swap these words around. And uh, so applying the modern context, we can see anywhere where a woman shows up in the text, uh, it might be a, a sacrifice, a, a burnt sacrifice, or a, just of fire or relating to fire. Um, so Zechariah 5. Then I looked up and I saw a scroll flying in the air. The word used is megula, which is, uh, or megila, I think, sorry, is uh, the word there. And this is what a megila looks like. It's a single scroll, uh, and it, it's not versus the one that are two round up together. So this is what they saw flying in the air, except it wasn't that size. Instead, you know, the angel said to me, what do you see? And I answered, I see a flying megila, a single roll, its length is 20 cubits, which is about 34 feet, and its width, which in this context is circumference. Uh, the, the word there for width is a, is a Greek interpretation, but uh, the same word is used to describe the circumference of the pillars on the temple. So, uh, so we know that it's 34 feet tall. It's got a circumference of about 17 feet or 10 cubits which is a diameter of about five and a half feet. Uh, and we, we can also know the ratio of the uh, width or the diameter versus the length just by the description of it looking like a megillah or a scroll. You wouldn't see a scroll that was half as wide as it is long. Uh, that would be um, uh, not consistent. So given that, this is... What we would see, these are intercontinental ballistic missiles. They look like scrolls, and they have the dimensions of about 34 or 35 feet to 40 feet. Uh, these are from all different countries around the world, and their diameter is five to six feet. So, you know, and it definitely looks like a megila <laughs> flying through the air if you compare those two things. So I think that's a pretty good description, complete with very accurate measurements. And you can imagine 2,500 years ago that no one could even conceive of a scroll that scale. Uh, it'd be a very um, interesting thing to try to describe. Then he, the angel, said unto me, this is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth. 
So, I mean, it's, it's flying around all over, and it's, it's the curse. So for everyone that stealeth shall be cut off or killed uh, on one side, according to it, and everyone that sweareth shall be cut off onto the other side of it. This is like, think of falling by the left and the right. People just, uh, if they're stealing and lying, uh, uh, are going to be cut off. And sweareth is sweareth falsely. It says, I will bring it forth. So once again, uh, Jehovah is saying that he's, he's the root cause of it coming forward because he puts it into the hearts of the kings, the ten kings, bricks. It says, I will bring it forth, says the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of or as a thief, uh, coming like a thief in the night, uh, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. Uh, think of, you know, one nation under God. Um, but we really aren't under him, are we? Uh, and it shall remain in the midst of the house, and it shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. And consuming stones, that's quite a fire. Uh, and consume it, you know, burn it all the way to ash, which is consistent with uh, you know, the fire offering uh, version of the word woman, the same th three letters. All right, so um, <clears throat> I already addressed that. Then the angel that talked uh, with me went forth, and he said unto me, Lift up thine eyes and see what this is that go forth. Basically, take a closer look. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah. So an ephah is a six-gallon container of dry goods, uh, so a payload. That goes forth. So he's basically saying, "Come look at the payload of this 34-foot tall Megillah." Uh, he said, "Moreover, this is the resemblance throughout all the earth. So this is not some kind of spiritualized scroll uh, in in a vision. Uh, there are many things throughout the entire earth that look like this. Not precisely. It's the resemblance of throughout the whole earth. So there's there's a lot of them." Um, so, behold, there was lifted up a talent, uh, which is 75 pounds, a talent of lead. Now, lead decays to uranium. <clears throat> and this is a woman, is what the text says, but this is a fire offering to be fully consumed that sitteth in the midst or in the middle of the ephah, of the payload. So we're saying we've got 75 pounds of lead in the middle of the payload, in a six-gallon payload. Then he said, this is wickedness. And he threw it back down to the middle of the payload, and he threw a lead covering on its opening. Nuclear bombs are coated, surrounded by lead to protect the people that are operating it and to hopefully shield it from detectors that are trying to locate them with uh, radiation sensors. <clears throat> so then I lift up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, or fires or flames. You can see here a lot of rockets have multiple fires or flames coming out of them. This uh, picture here has four of them, but it'd be easy to imagine that there are different configurations or that he only saw two of the four given the perspective he was in. And the wind was in their wings, or and this is there being the flames. So the wind was in the flames wings now, the word wings in Hebrew also means feathers. Uh, so I think like think of the clouds as like feathery clouds with the winds blowing around the contrail of the rocket taken off. For they had wings or feathers like the wings of a stork. It's basically a long trail of feathers. Uh, that's how I interpret that. And they lifted the ephah or the payload between heaven and earth. So this thing is, is going all the way up uh, onto the upper atmosphere the border of space. And I said to the angel who was speaking with me, where are they taking the payload? And he said unto me, to build a house, or to deploy the fire, in the land of Shinar, which is Babylon, uh, and it shall be established, uh, established is also saying to be delivered, so it should be established or delivered there, and it shall be set there, or thrown upon uh, her own base, or the ground. So this particular verse reads really awkward, so I uh, 
I translate it here directly. And he said to me to build a fire in the land of Babylon, and it shall arrive and be thrown down upon the ground. Uh, I don't have time to get into all the Strong's numbers and, and the meanings of all the words there, so you, you can look that up for yourself and, and verify, but uh, I believe that is a solid translation. Um, so, given how hard it would be to describe an ICBM to someone 200 years ago, imagine being shown this 2,500 years ago. Now, imagine being the scribe responsible for translating this over so many years. The measurements, the description, the shape alone narrow things down today. But nothing like it existed even 100 years ago. I mean, what relation was there between lead and fire before the nuclear age? Uh, this is the only interpretation of the text that makes sense compared to the nonsense of stuffing a woman in a six-gallon basket with 75 pounds of lead and putting a lead cover on it because she is so wicked. Um, the, the, it's pretty clear that there's one interpretation that makes sense and the other no one can really make a lot of sense of. Um, and I believe that our Creator is uh, a God of order who intends to communicate clearly and, and not in an ambiguous way or a way that is um, confusing. Uh, so if he's giving a, a vision with specific measurements, I think he means those measurements. Um, and that's why I have a lot of confidence in this particular interpretation. And we shall see more evidence for this later. All right, so we've established that the United States or NATO is probably Babylon. We've just established that the curse that's going and being sent to Babylon is a ICBM or a nuclear missile. Now let's look at how the Bible describes the fall of Babylon. Uh, so below I'm going to read from Jeremiah 50 to 51, and I'm going to pull out key verses. Uh, now there's two sets of verses in here, one that address uh, the fall, but in the midst of the fall or interwoven are verses that describe the rescue or the saving of of Israel, the, the people, the lost sheep that are dispersed among the nations, uh, they get saved in the midst of the fall of Babylon. Uh, and there are also several key phrases that directly link this to Revelation 6 with the red horse, Revelation 18, the second seal, and Matthew 24, the beginning of sorrows. Um, so that will help us figure out where the fall of Babylon and this, in particular, this description from Jeremiah fits in with the prophecy verses that most people are more familiar with, with Revelation, Matthew 24, and the like. All right. The word that Jehovah spoke against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. For out of the north, Russia, there cometh a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate. All right, so the first thing is, the fall of Babylon has nothing to do with a supernatural event. This is a nation that's coming against her. And throughout history, uh, God has used nations to judge other nations. So, and none that dwell therein uh, uh, shall remove. They shall depart. So none shall escape. They sh or, or they shall depart, both man and beast. So everyone's going to be gone. Going to be destroyed and burned. For lo, I will raise up and cause to come against Babylon an assembly of great nations, so an assembly or an alliance of great nation, out of the north, uh, Russia leading the BRICS, uh, from the country of the north. Uh, and there are other places in the Bible that link this to Iran, Syria as well. And they shall set themselves in array, an alliance against her. Uh, from thence she shall be taken. Their arrows, which I interpret as missiles, uh, shall be of, as of a mighty expert man. Mighty could imply nuke, a very mighty missile, uh, arrow indeed. None shall return in vain, which means none of them are going to miss or be intercepted. <clears throat> so we'll see more how the missiles and the weapons are likely the nukes. Because of the wrath of Jehovah, it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. Everyone that goes by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at all of her plagues. Put yourselves 
in array, alliance against Babylon, all around. Ye that bend the bow and shoot at her, spare no arrows, going to use all their nukes, for she has sinned against Jehovah. It is the vengeance of Jehovah. Uh, I've swapped Lord for Jehovah, so I apologize for the extra the. Take vengeance upon her, as she hath done. Do unto her. The United States is the only country to ever use nukes. So it seems like vengeance by nuke uh, would be appropriate, and it uh, would rule out other countries potentially being Babylon, uh, if, it, if you take that literally. How is the hammer of the whole earth cut asunder and broken? How is Babylon become a desolation among the nations? I have laid a snare for thee, and thou art also taken, O Babylon, and thou waste, and you and you are not aware, and you are found, and you are caught, because you have striven or strived against Jehovah. Jehovah has opened up his armory, so it's his armory. And he has brought forth the weapons, the ICM from Zechariah 5, of his indignation. For it is the work of the Lord Elohim of hosts in the land of the Chaldeans, Babylon. Woe unto them, for their day has come, the time of their visitation. That's important. That's a, a key phrase uh, that links uh, to other warnings. Uh, and I will kindle a fire. In his cities, and once again, this is plural, showing that Babylon is plural, and it shall devour, devour all around him. The reason the word him is here is because it was talking about the, the proud, the proud man is comparing Babylon to a proud man. I am, uh, I've been eluding or uh, leading a lot of verses in the interim that um, are just expound, you know, getting more flowery language around the same stuff, but I'm, I'm giving you the highlights. All right. Note that Babylon the Great is not a city, but composed of many cities. Uh, at this point, I'd like to point out a passage from Luke. For the day shall come upon thee, that your enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and encompass around thee. Notice we just read up above uh, that they were all around them, uh, and there was a snare. Uh, where, where was it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Kindle a fire, and it shall devour all around them. Um, there, where, where was it up here? Um, but the, that phrase, the, um, back to Luke. Uh, Your enemies ca shall cast a trench about thee, and compass around thee, and, and keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay you even with the ground, and your children with you. And they shall not leave one stone upon another. All the stones will be consumed. Everything will be burned. And why is that? Because you knew not the time of your visitation. You were not ready. You were caught like a thief in the night. Now, most people apply this verse to the temple being thrown down and Jerusalem being surrounded and sacked in 70 AD. I believe it's a double prophecy. Um, a lot of scriptures, as we'll see later, there are double prophecies where the same thing is fulfilled multiple times throughout uh, history. But uh, I think that's a, a lesson there, and I think that's why, you know, the time of your visitation, because you knew not uh, you're going to be caught. Um, then the king of Babylon, which would be either Biden or Trump, depending on when this happens, uh, maybe Biden wins a second term, um, hath heard the report of them, and his hands wax feeble. That sounds like Biden to me, but... Uh, anguish took hold of him, and pangs as a woman in travail. That is a key phrase that gives us an idea about what's also happening at the same time. All right. Now, so we'll, we'll visit the pangs of a woman in travail later. At the noise, or thundering, of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved. Right, The word there is quake or seismos. Uh, so there are earthquakes in various places. <coughs> um, and the cry is heard among the nations. So let's go and visit Isaiah 66, chapter 6. Uh, 666, six, six. who would have thought? A voice crying out a loud thunder or thunderings of noise from the city of Babylon, and a voice from the temple, a voice from Jehovah that rendered 
recompense to his enemies. Uh, so you can, we see the noise, thundering, crying out, thundering, noise, uh, and the earth being moved, and the vengeance of his, on his enemies, which is what we're talking about with the fall of Babylon being his vengeance. So we'll come back to Isaiah 66. Uh, but for now, the fall of Babylon continues in Jeremiah 51. Thus saith Jehovah, Behold, I will rise up against Babylon, and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me. A destroying wind, a nuclear shockwave, for this is the time of Jehovah's vengeance. We make it very clear that it's his vengeance this whole time. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Peace and safety and then sudden destruction. <clears throat> For her judgment, the curse, reacheth unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies. Now, that sounds very much like the flying scroll that reaches between heaven and earth and is, is lifted up through the sky. Uh, and the curse or the judgment. So that's uh, a good tie into Zechariah 5. Uh, it could also mean nuclear explosions or mushroom clouds that reach up to heaven or the skies. Uh, and all that dust could block out a third of the sun, moon, and stars. Uh, so I haven't analyzed that connection yet, but that's just a theory. And then they shall not take from thee a stone uh, for a corner, nor for a stone for a foundation, but you shall be desolate forever. So desolate forever basically means the radiation... Yeah, it's, it's going to be so bad that uh, no one will even use the stones to rebuild. So there's, there's no rebuilding. The stones here will be um, just not used. And if you think about it, if there was an all-out nuclear attack, we're not talking airburst. We're talking about bunker-busting nuclear bombs trying to uh, take things out. It's going to throw up a lot of highly radioactive dirt and dust into the air that will settle across the whole country. Uh, so then at the very end of the chapter, it says, you shall bind a stone to this book and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates. And then you shall say, thus shall Babylon sink and it shall not rise from the evil that I will bring. This is the verse that connects Jeremiah to Revelation 18. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea. So it's, you see how they're like following the exact same narrative in the two of things. All right. So that's the bad news. We're going to be completely destroyed. The good news is that his people uh, will rapture and escape from Babylon. Uh, so let's go back to the start of Jeremiah 50 and, and see how this progresses. In those days and in that time, says Jehovah, the children of Israel shall come and the children of Judah together, the northern and southern tribes spread across the nations. Uh, they're going, going and weeping. They shall go and shall seek Jehovah their Elohim, or Elohim means God. Um, they shall ask the way to Zion, the holy place, the, the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, with their faces towards Zion saying, come, let us join ourselves to Jehovah in a perpetual covenant, one that's not going to end that shall not be forgotten. The first covenant, we forgot the ways. And so basically there's going to be people in those days that are going to be returning to the ways uh, that have been forgotten. My people have been a lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place, their origin, their home. Um, so... Remove, come out of the midst of Babylon and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans and be as he goats before the flocks. Now, he goats means rams or leaders or perhaps first fruits. Um, and I, you can view this not as a instruction to come out of the midst of Babylon, but a command. You can think, think let there be light and it happened. I, this could be him calling forth, come, <laughs> come up to heaven. Uh, so, thus saith Jehovah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land, and I will bring uh, Israel again to his, inhabita his habitation. So he's going to bring us home. 
and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan, and his soul shall be satisfied upon Mount Ephraim and Gilead. In those days and in that time, says Jehovah, the iniquity of Israel will be sought for, and there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Basically, who, who he spares, the remnant. So that's the day where our, we are pardoned, our sins are forgiven, where we are born again. We'll see the born again theme coming up. Uh, so that's uh, looking promising. So uh, there's another part in here, uh, which I didn't include, but the evil people who attack his sheep who have gone astray, I say that they can do so, and you know they have the right to do so because they're not following his commandments. Uh, so we are vulnerable to um, to the devil and his people uh, when we're out of the will of of Jehovah. Um, so then I heard a loud voice in heaven. Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our Elohim and the power of his Messiah have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. Then they did not love their lives even to death. So Revelation twelve ten. So our sins are forgiven. You can't find any spots. The accuser being thrown down, potentially linked together. All right, back to Jeremiah. For the day has come the time of their visitation, the voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of Jehovah our Elohim, the vengeance of his temple. So, at the time of our visitation again, we see the voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon. Well, fleeing and escaping. But where do we go? We declare in Zion and what are we declaring? The vengeance. So the vengeance, we're, we're gone before the vengeance, and we get to declare it from a safe place. Not only are our sins pardoned, but we, the male child, uh, male child is another key word we'll see in a bit, escape to Zion. So what is Zion? Let's go to Hebrews. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living Elohim, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gathering. So it's the heavenly Jerusalem. That's where we escape to. One might ask if there is a difference between death by nuclear vaporization and the rapture, but I believe there are many more people that uh, die painfully from causes other than instant vaporization. Furthermore, those not in Babylon are likely to be saved at the same time. Then, from Zion, we declare the vengeance of Jehovah. Uh, if you've... Uh, seen the midst of, uh, sorry, seen the Left Behind movies, uh, imagine the chaos of people disappearing in the middle of a nuclear war. It'd be chaos, and most people might not even realize the rapture happened because communications will be down, things will be destroyed, EMPs, uh, you know, just be utter chaos. And right in the midst of that chaos is when he's going to snatch us out. Just like Lot was rescued from Sodom right before it was destroyed by fire, just like Noah entered the flood, just as the flood waters came. Jumping to Isaiah 61, which uh, this is the verse Yeshua read and stopped before completing the verse. The Spirit of Jehovah is upon me, because Jehovah has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of Jehovah. That's the sabbatical year, every seventh year. But he stopped there. But the rest of it reads, And the day of vengeance of Elohim, and to comfort all who mourn. Um, I highlighted that because the day of vengeance is what we've been reading about uh, with the fall of Babylon. Uh, and it's paired to with comfort and mourning. Uh, and we'll see that those two things are frequently tied together through Jeremiah, uh, which helps us identify that uh, this is a particular, referring to a particular time. All right, so to point to those that mourn in Zion. So where do we escape to? To Zion. 
to give them beauty for ashes, uh, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise. So it's, it's basically, we're, we're coming out of the ashes, uh, you know, because Babylon, Babylon's falling, and the, the world is just, we're mourning because of all the sin in the world, just like Daniel was mourning for Israel before he got the 77s prophecy. Uh, and they shall build the old wastes, and they shall rise up the former desolations. So uh, that gives you an idea of, you know, the day of vengeance we escape to Zion, and then we are refreshed before we come back down to for the millennial reign. All right, so let's continue in Jeremiah 51. And I will send unto Babylon fanners, and that shall fan her, and shall empty her land. A fanner is one who blows air to separate the wheat from the chaff. This is the theme of a harvest, of separating the good from the bad. The chaff is then burned in the fire. So let's look at Matthew 13, 30. Let both wheat and tares grow together until the harvest. At that time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, reapers will be the fanners, now first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. I guess gathering them in bundles might be surround them uh, and prepare them for being burned. And then the wheat is gathered into his barn, taken up to Zion. All right, back to Jeremiah. For Israel, the people of the northern kingdom and the nation state, not, sorry, northern kingdom, not the nation state, not the country in, that we think of as Israel, uh, has not been forsaken, nor Judah, these are the people of the southern kingdom, not the nation state, uh, nor Judah of his Elohim, the Jehovah of hosts. Though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel, flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver, give birth, every man his soul. So this is where we're going to be born again in spirit. This is the rapture. Be not cut off in her iniquity. Don't die with her in her sin. For the time, for this is the time of Jehovah's vengeance. So we flee, we go, we, or we deliver our soul, we don't die in sin, uh, and it's at the time of his vengeance. All those things link together perfectly. Jehovah has brought forth our righteousness. He's, he's bringing us the white robes. Um, this is Yeshua's salvation. And then let us declare in Zion the work of Jehovah our Elohim. So once again, we're in Zion and we're declaring all the great things he's doing, which right at the moment is judgment, but also the salvation. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters, and waters are symbolic of people, in the heavens. And he causes the water, or sorry, the vapors, which I'm saying water vapors, to ascend. So people are ascending, meeting him in the clouds like water vapor. So this is the rapture. And where are we ascending? From the ends of the earth. Uh, he maketh lightning with rain and brings forth the wind, I think his spirit out of his treasures. So he filters us with his spirit. Uh, you know, lightning is from east from the west, uh, I think is a, perhaps a reference there. This is clearly describing the rapture. Uh, and basically, he commands it and it happens. And when is this happening? At the fall of Babylon. Uh, you know, as lightning comes from the east from the uh, and shines from as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be the time of our visitation. For thus saith Jehovah of hosts, Elohim of Israel, the daughter of Babylon, uh, is like a threshing floor. It is time to thresh her, get a little while, and the time of her harvest shall come. So the daughter of Babylon, I think, is, um, is the Jews and, and the people that remain and survive. Uh, and so this will be most of the rest of the world uh, that's left behind. Uh, and they're going to be threshed into the tribulation just a little while longer. Uh, and that references or links to Revelation uh, 6, 9 through 10, the fifth seal, where those who are under the altar that had received a white robe were told to wait a, a little longer for vengeance. Um, so it, it seems like uh, 
just a little while longer, this three and a half year tribulation to proceed. So, uh, my people, take yourself out of the midst of her and deliver, give birth, bring forth you and every man his soul from the fierce anger of Jehovah. And a final message to everyone on earth that escaped the fall of Babylon. You that have escaped the sword, the fire, the nukes, go away, stand not still, remember Jehovah afar off, and let Jerusalem come into your mind. So let's revisit this verse. The king of Babylon, uh, Biden or Trump, has heard the report of them, and his hands waxed feeble. Anguish took hold of him, and pangs as a woman in travail. Now back to Isaiah 66. If you remember, we had this earlier about the sound, a cry of thunder from the city of Babylon uh, and the vengeance of his enemies. So right after that, the very next verse, before she travailed, pangs of a woman in travail. So before that, she brought forth and delivered. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child who hath heard of such a thing, who hath seen such things. Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born, born again at once? All the people that are born become a nation. For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. So this man-child is talking about her children. That's all of us who follow Jehovah. Note the references to Jeremiah and Isaiah, consider deliver every man his soul and delivering a man-child and bringing forth a children. They're all related or could be related. So we see fall of Babylon, the rapture, all happening at the same time that they happen at the beginning of the tribulation at the fall of Babylon. All right, so now we just need to identify when is all this going to happen and uh, what I can narrow it down to a year. And once you know the year, you can probably narrow it down to one of the feast days within that year. So we have maybe a dozen different dates that we should be looking at. Um, uh, Keep in mind that I'm not saying that this is going to happen precisely. There's all kinds of opportunities for error in um, interpretation or historical references, but the information that we have today is pretty solid, uh, and the scriptures are pretty clear. So, um, you know, this concept of the day, time of Jehovah's vengeance is mentioned throughout the scripture. I just touched on a small portion of it here. Uh, And there's lots of verses and prophecies that point to it. So we're not relying on any one measure, but we're taking a whole lot of different measures that all triangulate to the same window of time. Uh, And I believe that this shows to 2024, 2025 to be the window of time. Um, And we'll go from there. Now, before I do that, I want to link this to things in Revelation. Uh, So pay attention to the word, use of the word sword here and how it connects to nukes and ICBMs. Uh, So from Jeremiah, a sword is upon the Babylonians, says Jehovah, and upon the inhabitants of Babylon, and upon her princes and upon her wise men. A sword is upon the liars, that's where the curse is going after, and they shall dote. A sword is upon her mighty men, and they shall be dismayed. A sword is upon their horses and upon their chariots and upon all the mingled people that are in the midst of her. We are a mingled nation. Uh, And they shall become as women. Wait, no. They shall become as a fire offering, completely burnt to ash. A sword is upon her treasures and they shall be robbed. So uh, it makes far more sense. The sword is the nuke that's turning everyone to ash. And rather than the sword is turning everything it touches into women. Uh, that makes no sense. Um, so you can only tell the meaning from the context given of Zechariah 5 and Babylon being destroyed by fire. It's pretty clear that fire offering is far, far better translation. All right. And then Revelation 6 
gives us a good idea of the timing of the second seal. Then the lamb opened the second seal. I heard a second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out of a fiery red one. Its rider was given the power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. That sounds like a nuke to me. Note the connection between sword, liars, being robbed. In Zechariah 5 it says this is the curse, the ICBM, that goes over the whole face of the earth. Every thief and every liar shall be killed. And then we have, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Uh, people, the United States is the only one that's used nukes. So, not looking promising. All right, note that Babylon is killed with a large sword. Uh, so, we can also link the uh, sword to the curse of Zechariah 5 via Isaiah 34, 5. For my sword, ICBM, shall be bathed in heaven, uh, or, or carried between heaven and earth for a short period of time. Behold, it shall come down upon Edom, and, shall, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. So, Edom looks like the United States is not going to be the only one that's going to hit, uh, but also Edom, which, if that's the same geographical location, that would be south of, of uh, Jerusalem. Um, this verse clearly links the sword to something carried to heaven and coming down, as well as the curse and judgment. That's uh, quite a number of key words that link these concepts together. So uh, that's one of the keys to understanding the scripture, is understanding the symbolic meaning of various words and how they link phrases together. All right, so now, how do we know when all of this is going to happen? The book of Daniel gives a very precise timeline, uh, timeline on when to expect the Messiah and how long his people, Israel, uh, have during which everything must be complete. Now, there's this verse that everyone thinks they understand, but uh, I hope to shed new light on it today. Seventy sevens, the word sevens there is groups of sevens, a.k.a. jubilee, are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, that hasn't happened yet, and to seal up and complete the vision and prophecy. So seal up this is basically to complete. Right? You're done, you put your seal of completion on it and to anoint the most holy. So normally, people interpret this as 490 years, 70 sevens. But um, the insight that I'm sharing here is that this is actually 70 jubilees. A jubilee is a group of seven sevens. So, you know, most commentaries use the English translation 70 weeks and assume 490 years. However, that translation clearly cannot be true, the, the true or only translation, given that it has been over 2,500 years, uh, and we have yet to make an end of sins or to bring in everlasting righteousness, nor to complete the vision and prophecy. Um, you could argue that Yeshua put an end to sins as far as paying the price, but bringing in everlasting righteousness, that's the rapture. That's when uh, um, we get our new bodies in the millennial reign. So you could read this as, uh, this is how long you have until the millennial reign. The key to uh, proving the interpretation as jubilees is that the word sevens, or weeks, in, is in the masculine Hebrew form. So this is... Uh, the feminine versus the masculine, you can see this last letter here is different. And in this particular use case, it means multiple sevens. If you go to Google and ask it to translate this, it might translate it as 70. Um, but it could, the, the multiple here isn't really defined. Um, but it's pretty clear from context of the Bible that it means jubilee. Uh, and we'll, we'll see more about that later. So that's 3,430 years, and the 3,431st year is the final 70th Jubilee. So all we need to do is identify when the count started. 
So because uh, this tells you the span, so we know how many years. Uh, and now we, once we know the start, then we'll know the end and when that jubilee is. So let's go to Leviticus 25. Yehovah said to Moses at Mount Sinai, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to Yehovah. Right? And so this is the instructions. For six years, sow your fields, and for six years, prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a rest of a Sabbath, or a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to Yehovah. All right. Now it says, count off seven Sabbath years, seven times seven years. Uh, that's what the scripture actually says, seven times seven to explain how to count it off. So that the seven Sabbath years amount to a period of 49 years. Then have a trumpet sounded everywhere on earth on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, the last trump. Uh, sound the trumpet throughout your land, consecrate the 50th year, and proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Uh, in this year of jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. All right. So we know what a jubilee is. It's a group of seven years. We know that there's 70 of them and it, that it starts when they come into the land. That's the Jordan crossing. So when is the Jordan crossing? There are many great YouTube videos to support this. I found this particular video about the exodus of Pharaoh. You know, that's a picture. That's the actual Pharaoh from, uh, from Egypt during the exodus. And they provide a lot of evidence approving that. He reigned from 1450 BC to 1425 BC. We know they wandered in the desert for 40 years. Uh, and then they crossed the Jordan in the first month. So this puts the crossing between 1408 and 1383 BC. Now there's a lot of estimates about when they crossed the Jordan, but only 1407 and 1406 fit the other evidence uh, that I have seen. Um, and there's a lot of that evidence, a lot of commentaries uh, that narrow it down to that time frame. All right, now I found this chart about the 120 jubilees of creation. It says, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Here there's each day, sorry, it's each year is a jubilee. So 120 jubilees for mankind, from Adam to the millennial reign, um, is, is one way that's interpreted. Um, but we can also see on this chart some other important dates from uh, 2024 to 1407 that you get your 70 jubilees uh, right there. So from the Jordan until 2024. Uh, and then from there back to Adam is 50 jubilees, 120 years. Um, and there's some, there's some other dates on here that um, are not really relevant to this uh, discussion, but uh, I thought, thought that chart was useful. Furthermore, uh, there are clay tablets from the 38th year of King Nebuchadnezzar that provide 21 precise measurements of the sun, moon, and planets that allow us to ap accurately map biblical dates to modern BC AD years, you know, plus or minus six months, depending on you know, religious versus civil calendar and the like. Uh, so we've got very accurate timing of years. There's no missing, you know, 10 years here, or Gregorian, Julian calendar, all that stuff is not relevant because with the sun, moon, and stars, we've connected it to 30th year of Nebuchadnezzar, which is hundreds of years BC. Um, so what all this tells us is that Day of Atonement 2024 at the last trump the 70th Jubilee should begin. Uh, I don't know if it's going to happen on that day or in that year, uh, but the day of vengeance or the year of vengeance of our Elohim and the time to comfort all that mourn as described in Isaiah 61. Now, Yeshua had the first part in the synagogue, you know, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found a place where it's written, 
And we read this earlier. You know, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he stopped there right before the judgment. And he rolled it up and he gave it back. So this verse is complete on his second coming. You know, complain the, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance and to comfort and all that mourn. So note these two things are tied together, vengeance and comfort. Uh, and then Jeremiah 51, 8. Babylon will suddenly fall and be broken. Wail, mourn for her. So falling, mourning, you know, vengeance, uh, and comforting those who mourn. All right, let's talk about returning to the land. The major theme of Jubilee is forgiveness or the pardon of debts or sins and returning to your own possession, property, or land. This is defined in Leviticus and then described in the midst of the fall of Babylon. So, in the year of Jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. Jeremiah 51, 9. Let us leave her and go each to our own land. Jeremiah 50, 16. Let everyone return to their own people. Let everyone flee or escape to their own land. So we get to return to our heavenly Jerusalem uh, on a Jubilee year. So that's how we know that the 70th Jubilee is when the fall of Babylon occurs. And if our dating of the Jordan crossing is right, then our counts are right. We have a pretty high degree of confidence. All right, now let's deal with wars and rumors. Jeremiah connects the fall of Babylon to uh, the better known signs from Matthew 24. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled or afraid. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes or shakings or nuclear explosions in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows, of mourning. So, you know, explosions, sorrows, uh, mourning. So fall, comforting those who mourn. You see the relationship there, that parallel. Now let's look at what Jeremiah has to say. It's like almost exactly the same wording as Yeshua. Do not lose heart or be afraid. When rumors are heard in the land, one rumor comes this year, another next. Rumors of wars, of violence in the land, and of ruler or kingdom against ruler or kingdom. For the time will surely come when I will punish the idols of Babylon. Her whole land will be disgraced, and her slain will lie fallen within her. That sounds like earthquakes. And, uh, and we can see here, at the noise of the taken of Babylon, the earth is moved. It quakes or it shakes. There are earthquakes and various shaking. And the cry or the mourning uh, will be heard among the nations. So here we see earthquakes, noise at the fall of Babylon, we see that this is um, immediately after the verse of the wars, rumors of wars, and kingdom against kingdom. Uh, so in Matthew, uh, it says these are the beginning of sorrows. All right, the earthquakes is the judgment, and these are the beginning of sorrows. And here we see it's the fall of Babylon uh, and the sorrows, and you know, earthquakes, sorrows. So it's very clear to me that the fall of Babylon is directly tied and complete as part of the beginning of sorrows in Matthew 24, 6 through 8, placing uh, it at the beginning of the tribulation, uh, which places the rapture at the beginning. So this is pre-trib rapture support, proof positive, um, as strong as I've ever seen it. All right. In context, it would be, um, yeah, it would be reasonable to assume the equivalence of the beginning of sorrows with the fall of Babylon. It would make sense given that Babylon falls suddenly in one hour, right? It comes like a thief in the night. Uh, so, you know, you're told to be like we would be paired. One person would be in a field and taken, and the other would be left. Um, so, you know, life is going on like normal, and then boom, it's. 
big boom. It no longer is. People are raptured and the bombs start falling. All right, then we go back to Daniel. At that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and shall, and there shall be a time of trouble such never is seen, uh, never was, and since there was a nation, and even, uh, sorry, I'm troubling, having trouble with the King James, such as never was since there, and was a nation, and even to that same time, and at that time your people will be delivered. Every one that shall be found written in the book. So, you know, great trouble, everyone is delivered. Um, but thou, o Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end, because many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So, I think our knowledge has increased, which has allowed us to have the context to understand these. Until the ICBM and nuclear bombs, None of these prophecies could have made sense uh, before we had the Bible with searchable indexes and all the tools we have available today. It was very difficult to run to and from the scripture and to increase knowledge of the scripture. Uh, I think this also parallels Daniel. He was studying Jeremiah uh, when he realized that the 70 years in Babylon was coming to an end. Uh, he didn't realize it until... At the very end, just before they were coming out of Babylon, that uh, the prophecy was up. And, and ironically, you're studying the exact same book, Jeremiah, that we're using to determine the end, at the end of 70 Jubilees. Uh, I find that very fascinating, uh, how this knowledge is being revealed to us now. Daniel asks, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? It says time, times, and a half. So three and a half years from the Jubilee. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter or distribute the power to rule of the holy people. Basically, he appoints us to rule in the millennial kingdom. Uh, and to, uh, I would guess, come and fight the battle of Armageddon with his people. All these things shall be finished. So three and a half years from fall of Babylon, uh, which comes after wars and rumors of wars, uh, which you could say that since 2020, particularly the invasion of Ukraine, we've had wars and rumors of wars. So that might have been the start if you're looking for a, a seven-year time frame. All right, so there's, let's look at some other points to highlight the current time. Commands to rebuild. The book of Daniel provides a precise marker for when to expect the Messiah. He's coming twice, so maybe uh, it will tell us when he's going to expect him both times. And it says it's 69 weeks of years uh, from the order to rebuild Jerusalem. It says, Know and discern that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the time of or the week of the anointed one, the prince, these words are just put right next to each other. So I think the first one is Messiah. The second one is when he comes back as King of Kings. Uh, shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. Uh, so that's seven plus 62 is 69 weeks. And then there's a colon. It says, it shall be built again with a plaza and moat, even in uh, troublesome times. So most people are familiar with the first order. From the seventh year of, uh, I'm not even going to try to, Arch Xerxes. Uh, this is recorded in Ezra 7 8, so from 457 BC until 27 AD. And that's 69 weeks of years. That's the start of Yeshua's ministry, uh, his anointing at his baptism. All right, so that's when he becomes the anointed one. <clears throat> This lands perfectly on the Shemitah cycle and has the Messiah cut off, but not for his own sins. Right? He dies for us in the midst of the 31st week. Uh, sorry, in the midst of the week, which is 31 AD. A lot of people are stuck on 30 or uh, 33 AD, but uh, the timing here says it was 31 AD. Uh, we'll let the calendar discussions be for another time. 
Most uh, translations recorded Messiah Prince. I kind of highlighted it earlier. Uh, but I believe this is a double prophecy because there are two comings. The first as Savior and the second as Kings. But most people don't realize is that there was a second decree, a, a second decree for the second coming. In 1537, Sultan Suleiman I issued a decree to rebuild the city walls and moat of Jerusalem uh, and the plaza and moat. So you add 69 times 7 years and you get 2020. And we are currently in the midst of the seven years where the prince king is to be expected. Um, there are some other dates here that could uh, shift this back three years, depending on which order, which would put 2024 as the time to be expected. Uh, and, and also align it with the Shemitah cycles. But uh, another way of viewing it is this first coming was the first three and a half years of a Shemitah cycle, and his second coming is the last three and a half years of the Shemitah cycle. All right, and so this is you know, a copy of the order. These are engraved in stones. In Jerusalem, you can go, actually go see these orders, of these decrees. They've been hidden in plain sight. The first time Jerusalem was rebuilt, no foreigners helped. The enemies of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people had come back to rebuild the temple of Jehovah Elohim of Israel. They went to Zerubbabel and to the family leaders and said, Let us help! Ever since King Hadrian of Assyria brought us here, we have worshipped your Elohim and offered sacrifices to him. But Joshua and the family leaders answered, you cannot take part in building the temple for Jehovah our Elohim. We will build it ourselves, just as King Cyrus of Persia commanded us. So foreigners were not allowed to help. But look at this. Isaiah 6.10 reads, Jehovah said, Jerusalem, your city walls will be rebuilt by foreigners. So this clearly shows that one time they're going to be rebuilt commanded to be rebuilt by themselves and not by foreigners. And the second time, they're going to be rebuilt by foreigners, which would be the uh, Muslims rebuilding it. So, and while the first decree said nothing about a plaza and moat, the second decree specifically mentioned it. Also, all told, Yeshua's first coming was during the first 3.5 years of the 70th week, and this decree looks like the second uh, coming will be during the last 3.5 years of the 70th week. All right. And then lastly, we have another reference that points to this point in time. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and to the abomination that maketh desolate is set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and thirty fifth day. So you add those two together, and uh, let's see what this looks like. From the time Nebuchadnezzar plundered the temple and stopped sacrifices, 597 B.C., until the Dome of the Rock, 1,290 years. And from, the, uh, from that abomination, uh, it doesn't really cause desolation. I think this is going to repeat again in, in the future. Um, wait... Uh, 1,335 years, and we reach 2028, which that would be the end of the tribulation. Uh, bottom line is that points to this season of time. Um, now, furthermore, uh, I'm going to do another post that connects the abomination of desolation with a, with a nuke, because it, it's on the wings of abomination. Uh, we saw the word wings used three times in Zechariah. Uh, so I think that that's also a nuke. So Jerusalem will probably be nuked as well. The difference being it will be rebuilt. All right. This post is already long enough, but uh, I think we can say that sometime between April 8th, 2024 and October 25 is the only time that aligns with the Jubilee schedule. This will be the 70th Jubilee since the Jordan crossing and the end of the 70th week 
of, uh, of weeks or 490 years uh, since the order went out to rebuild Jerusalem. So we've got two things, the 70 jubilees and the 70th week of the second order to rebuild. Uh, and then, of course, the Dome of the Rock uh, also points to this time. Uh, in addition to this, there are also two days or 2,000 years, minus seven for the tribulation, from the crucifixion in 31 AD. So uh, there's a ton of prophecies that line up with uh, two days for him to return and a day is a 1,000 years. So you can see we're triangulating with many, many, many different data points that point to, you know, just, a, you know, 2024, 2025 as being the season. Given all the signs associated with the three eclipse forming the Aleph and the Tav over America and the USA, and countless other signs, including the rapidly escalating war between NATO and the BRICS, the red heifers in Israel, I would venture to say that Babylon the Great could fall any day. However, knowing that Jehovah does everything in perfect timing, I suspect it will be during one of his appointed times or feast days. Uh, so I highly recommend you study his calendar uh, and his, his seven annual feasts and start observing them. And uh, stay away from the pagan feasts of Christmas and Easter and Halloween and St. Patrick's Day and uh, all those things. Uh, we are given the holy days, and that's when he likes to move. It could be this Passover, uh, but since it's not quite the Jubilee year yet, um, unless maybe we misunderstand and Jubilee starts at the uh, start of the next religious year, uh, but it's likely going to be this fall. Um, and, you know, those are the eclipses that form the Aleph Tav over the United States. That's a sign in the sun, moon, and stars marking the coming judgment of the USA. Uh, further confirmation that uh, it's Babylon the Great, by the way, if you, if you combine this sign with everything else uh, that's going on. Uh, if you'd like to understand all those other signs, I recommend Messiah 2030. They're basing everything off of a 30 AD crucifixion, but the uh, majority of the information is still relevant from the two days uh, as a thousand years. There's lots of prophecies there confirming that uh, and other things um, pointing to <clears throat> 2030 back up seven years, you get 2023, or if it's 2031, you get 2024. So uh, good video with lots of information. Uh, remember, no one's got all the information, but everyone's got something useful you can glean. All right. Um, and, you know, here I've reconstructed the timeline of Yeshua's resurrection using dozens of historical reference points, each of which involves very detailed study. Uh, so I, I determined 31 AD even before I had the Jubilee and uh, the um, clay tablets from the 38th year of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, you can see how all the things line up with his ministry, 40 inclusive years of various things going on at the temple. Um, and, you know, we've got the Chinese emperor who recorded the man from heaven to pardon sins. Uh, and precisely when that was, we know when um, various people were killed because of the uh, of reports made to the Roman Senate. We have eclipses that were recorded. We know in John's ministry, all these things add up to a very detailed timeline where you can't move it one way or the other without um, having to choose to ignore certain evidence. Um, but this is all consistent. So, given this information, uh, it's time to wake up, you know, let's not be asleep, and watch. We're commanded to watch. Uh, it's not an option. If you don't watch, you're going to be caught like a thief. Um, and um, you know, I used to think that if I missed the rapture, I would have time to repent. Like, oh, everyone disappeared. I must have gotten something wrong and go study and repent and, uh, you know, try to get it right, uh, see what I missed. But if what we're reading here is correct, if you live in Babylon, then sudden destruction is going to come. And for a third of the Earth's population, 
you're going to have no time at all to repent uh, or study. You're not going to have to worry about the Antichrist or the mark of the beast or any of those things. If you live in Babylon, you're either going to be raptured or you're going to burn in a nuclear holocaust uh, without escape. Um, so that's not great news for the people that live in Babylon. The rest of the world that manages to escape, they can deal with those things, um, with the with the Antichrist and and everything that that entails. But uh, this is really ups the ante, the importance of getting right before the rapture, of having faith before you see the miracle of people disappearing. Um, and you know, you're not going to be able to prep or survive, uh, you know, with a with a bunker or anything like that, because the land's going to be made desolate. So, uh, you know, repent, get right. Now is the time to do it. Now is the early warning. And the uh, modern church, you know, is steeped in lots of false doctrine. Doesn't even know their identity as the lost sheep of Israel. Uh, so, if you want to spiritually prepare for what is coming, then. Uh, I would suggest studying and stop relying on your pastors in your churches to give you the information you need. You need to study the word and know who you are. You know, are you a Jew, Gentile, Israel, something else? I, I highly recommend this video on the lost sheep uh, from Parable at the Vineyard. Uh, Jim Staley from Passion for Truth also has a video. It's three hours long on identity crisis that is worthwhile watching. And uh, if you just want to follow the news and see how close we are to nuclear annihilation with Russia, uh, Canadian prepper, uh, he's an agnostic, doesn't really believe in the Bible and all this stuff, but he does follow the news and will let you tell you uh, stuff that the mainstream media is not telling you about the ongoing war with Russia and exactly how close we are to um, this prophecy being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. Um, and of course, uh, this eclipse and all the signs associated with it, um, lots of things going on. So thank you very much for watching, and uh, I hope you found this useful.